Today, we're going to get into why the XRPO is the ideal blockchain for the tokenization of real world assets and why banks and institutions are going to choose it over things like Solana or XDC or Bitcoin or Ethereum. We're going to break it down and go through the amendments one by one that have been instrumental in placing it as the main blockchain that banks and institutions are going to use. And we're going to go through three different things, the core features, compliance, and why some of the tokens issued on here are ideal for tokenization of real world assets. So first up, we're going to talk about the core features of the XRPL and why it's the ideal blockchain for the tokenization of real world assets. First up, number one, you guys may remember this, but back in 2022, they launched NFTs on the XRPL. And this was way after the craze on Solana and Ethereum. And the main difference here is this is not a layer two. It's built into the mainnet of the XRPL. And you're able to issue NFTs directly on chain. There are smart contract features and components that are associated with these NFTs. You can still do the royalties. You can still fractionalize them. You can trade them. You can put them up as collateral. And that's what you need. So many people believe that you can band-aid stuff or add a layer two but really you're just adding more complexity to a system. In reality, banks and institutions are gonna to want to be able to use one network for all these things. And so that's why NFTs on the XRPO are fast, cheap, easy, and they were late to the game, obviously, after a lot of other people had minted them on their network and we saw a big crazy run on price appreciation for NFTs, but they really do have real world utility. You could mint deeds to a property or carbon credits or the real estate itself, and be able to trade those and again, fractionalize it and be able to have royalties on it. There's, there's many things that you would want to have a non-fungible token for, which is what an NFT is for those that may not know, but those are native to the mainnet, thanks to XLS 20, which was passed again in 2022. Later on in 2024, we finally got automated market makers. And this was early in the year. They had proposed the amendment back in like October 23. And it took a long time before all of the validators on the network came to the consensus and actually passed this deal. And there's a big difference between these AMMs and the AMMs on, again, some other networks. So Ethereum and Solana and many other smart contract networks have automated market makers. The difference here is people that represent the value inside of the liquidity pool are not taxed. The LP token increases in value and people bid or arbitrage that market and have to bid an LP token. So they burn those when they bid for those opportunities to arbitrage those markets. And that reduces the supply of the LP tokens in the pool. And that for it increases the price of the LP tokens in the pool. So as these become much more adopted and used, we do have a few AMMs on the XRPL. We have one that's a good friend of mine that actually is actually the largest AMM currently with $15 million in liquidity in crypto land. Shout out to you guys. But this is a game changer and it creates a vibrant market and it's alive and well today. And it's what is going to make the XRPL the go-to platform for liquid trading of tokenized assets in the future. And right on that's heels, we don't have this up for vote yet, but it has been proposed is XLS 65D and that's liquidity pools on the XRPL. And again, you can use that LP token from the AMMs, and then you would also get an LP token for representing your value in these pools. Uh, but this will pair assets, right? So you have ROUSD against XRP. You could put that in the pool. I think that these are going to be a bit different though. You'll be able to contribute your XRP to a liquidity pool and somebody will be like a general partner that will manage that pool and allocate that appropriately to be able to generate returns for the partners or the LPs in the pool. And this is actually, I think, gonna be adopted at scale for people that are running funds. This will be a really good way for people to allocate capital in kind or in stable coins or whatever other issued assets on the XRPL exist into these pools that are then managed by somebody else and promise a return. And I think these will end up being uh, run as securities. The AMMs, it's gonna be difficult. They are gonna be a market, right? And it's an automated market maker. So it's a DEX that allows for interoperability between these assets and real-time settlement and a lot of liquidity between issued assets on the XRPL. And with that, it's a big deal for institutions. It removes a lot of the slippage and so do the liquidity pools. So for all of these reasons, faster, cheaper, less slippage, easier in and out, all those things, I think you're going to see institutional adoption of these AMMs and liquidity pools by institutions over some of the other options that are a bit clunkier 
on maybe Solana or Ethereum. And again, you know, participating in these pools, your returns grow tax free. So it's a big deal until you take the, the returns out. Next up, we have XLS 47D, and that was price oracles. And so none of this is possible. Like you're not going to be able to trade real time or have real market data or pull prices from institutional trading on the stock exchange or for bonds or for commodities or for Forex or for whatever other market they're going to be trading on the XRPL for these tokenized real world assets, unless you have price oracles. So you need interoperability with Chainlink, you need interoperability with the FTSO or Flare time series oracle maybe iota maybe even dag or constellation there's going to be some winners in that space the xrpl itself is not an oracle you need some way to move data from the real world that we all live in into on-chain environments and into smart contracts so that those can then self-execute based on the constraints that are listed there and without the integration of price oracles these markets are just a fantasy on the XRPL, but this has been passed and it's ready to go. And so again, this is one of those things that I think people kind of discount, but these are all precursors that need to be in place before we're gonna see the real big prices for XRP that a lot of people are hoping for. Next up, we have XLS 64D and that's pseudo accounts. And this again is, you know, just like 65, has not quite been passed yet. It's not even put up for vote yet. However, it allows for the ledger entries to hold and manage assets on behalf of others. So basically you're, you're delegating the value somewhere else where your asset doesn't have to move. So right now we provide institutional custody for our clients at Anchorage. Their assets would be able to sit in their accounts on the XRPL and then we could delegate that value somewhere else using a pseudo account like XLS 64D when it's passed. And it has a lot of flexibility to the management of assets. It also creates a world where the custody rule that was proposed by the SEC in 2023 could actually be adapted and used by banks and institutions, whereas today it's really not feasible for the way that things are structured. But if you are able to delegate things or create a representation of value somewhere else and hold the asset there in institutional custody with multi-party signature and controls around it, that kind of leads to, again, the XRPL being pretty much the only game in town when it comes to tokenization of real world assets and not to say there won't be other chains that adapt this feature again the xrpl doesn't even have it right now because it hasn't been voted on but it has been proposed and i think that it's going to be a big piece of what makes this blockchain the most compliant and secure in comparison to others and why it gets the adoption that we're hopeful for so that kind of leads into the next section here which is the, the compliance and the security enhancements that have been added in to the XRPL. So first up there, we're gonna talk about side chains. The main side chain that most people are aware of is gonna be the EVM side chain. We also have the hook side chain. The EVM side chain is a big, big deal. JP Morgan made a big met on Ethereum and they built their infrastructure called Onyx, which is EVM based, and they needed to be interoperable with the XRPL. And so we have Axelar that bridges Onyx over to the side chain on the XRPL and would allow for settlement through XRP for any transactions or tokenized assets from that environment across others. Uh, Axel are another big player, but again, without that EVM sidechain, it's not really gonna work out for the XRPL without Goldman and JP Morgan and these other institutions giving it the green light and having interoperability or a way to participate. I don't think they were happy about that. So now that we've seen that kind of come alive, these sidechains allow for separate blockchains to be linked to the XRPL which is a big win for compliance because different countries have different regulations and you might see different winners in other places. Bank in Europe could use a side chain tailored to EU's laws while wanting to stay connected to XRPL's global network. And so side chains allow for testing for new features also like hooks before they're launched on the mainnet. Since this is live, banks can now start exploring these side chains for regulatory alignment. And I think that's what you're gonna see. I think you might see multiple jurisdictions issue different side chains on the XRPL that have the regulatory confines for how they are supposed to transact. You might even see specific institutions operate on a specific side chain, but they will all operate and be connected to the main net for settlement between these independent side chains. And that's what allows them to maintain regulatory compliance, but also be interoperable with all of the other jurisdictions and other players on the planet. So that kind of leads into this other piece, which is for KYC, KYB, you have to know who you're participating with sanctions and the swift system are a real thing and one of the promises of the xrpl is that it is going to be the settlement layer for the swift system but to be able to do that 
you need a decentralized identity or DID, which gives users control over their digital identity. For banks, this streamlines KYC, which is know your customer. And it also makes it a lot less costly than what it is today. We work with providers for KYC for the RIA and other things that we do. And we have to run one of those pretty much for every person we deal with and KYB or know your business. And if you could just share a hash from your digital identity that's already been verified by third-party components or, or players that are interoperable with the network and hold that data and then just share it securely based on the needs of who you're participating with, that makes that a lot more streamlined and it's a lot cheaper. And this feature being live makes onboarding much faster and more compliant with new, new global regulations that are rolling out. And I think, again, this is one of those things that sets the XRPL apart from other networks, uh, other smart contracts. There's a lot of people out there looking to solve this problem, but they are a separate company that are interoperable with multiple chains and they're doing KYC and they're charging people for the KYC. But I think you're just going to have a repository of data that's securely held somewhere. You'll have to verify yourself once. I don't know if you've ever done this, but like if you participate on multiple platforms, as an example, we do a lot of private equity deals. And if you were to go sign up with Forge and then Equities In and then Hive or Link to or MPM, but there's, there's a lot of people out there that do private equity deals or broker those. And every single one of those, you have to go through KYC, KYV over and over and over again. So if you could just show up and share a hash from your DID, and they were able to get whatever information they needed and then be able to verify that on chain in seconds. And you wouldn't have to go through and put everything in over and over again. It would just save both parties a lot of time and a lot of headache to know that they're dealing with the right person and you're not on the sanctions list, not OFAC and, and BIS, you're checked and, and you're good to go. Uh, and that kind of leads to the next component here. So if you are going to be participating on private equity deals, then you're going to need some type of credentials, most of which are going to be accreditation here in the U.S. But there's sophisticated investor there in the UK and other jurisdictions. You might be a qualified purchaser. You might be a qualified client. So there's a lot of things or, or credentials that you might have that would allow you to participate in different ecosystems or bar you from participating in certain ecosystems. And so this amendment, XLS 59D, which is not quite passed yet, it's got 27 out of the 28 votes that it needs to be able to be passed on chain. It allows for verifiable credentials like licenses or certifications. Those would be stored and you could check those on the XRPL. This is perfect for banks needing to verify clients' credentials instantly, reducing fraud and all the paperwork like I mentioned before. So example, a bank could run and confirm a borrower's professional license in seconds. This feature would enhance trust and efficiency in financial interactions. And again, this would happen in seconds instead of days, which is what it takes now. The next up, we have another big piece here, and this is something institutions absolutely have to have for issued assets. Talking to uh, the digital chamber and even the SEC, a lot of people are thinking you got to roll back a blockchain. If an asset ends up somewhere it's not supposed to be or gets sent to the wrong spot or somebody steals it or you, there's a hack, and you would normally, right? If it was the native asset on chain, you would have to roll the trip the blockchain back. But with issued assets, you can have a callback provision or a smart contract component. And on the XRPL, that's XLS 39D. And what that allows is it lets issuers revoke tokens under specific conditions like fraud or regulatory violations, right? So this is critical for banks to be compliant with the laws and protect their systems. If a tokenized asset is misused, a callback allows the issuer to reclaim it and acts as a safety net. This feature is invaluable when it comes to positioning the XRPL as, again, one of the go-to chain for institutions to issue their tokenized assets on and the security around that. If, if you couldn't claw things back and unwind things without having to roll back the whole blockchain, it just isn't feasible. Uh, next up, and this kind of goes along with the clawback, is the deep freeze. So this is XLS. 77D, and it allows issuers to freeze assets in an account. So I just want to make the clarification here that XRP itself cannot be clawed back. It cannot be frozen, but only issued assets on the XRPL would be under these provisions or these amendments that have been issued here. But this allows, again, people to freeze issued assets and prevent their movement. So if there was money that got sent to an account that was from somebody that's on the sanctions list, it could happen. Somebody could commit fraud after already being allowed to participate on something, and then you find out about it later. You know, or, you know, there could be charging order or something specific in a lawsuit that doesn't allow assets to be moved or ownership to be changed, and you would need the ability to freeze assets immediately. Again, people are going to be mad about this, but all these things are the reality of the world that we live in, and you do need these for banks and institutions to adopt this. So again, they'd be able to enforce sanctions or legal orders. For instance, if a court ordered 
an asset to be frozen, a bank can comply immediately on the XRPL. And this live feature ensures institutions can operate within legal boundaries while using the DEX or the decentralized exchange that lives on the XRPL. And again, just meets a super high level of regulatory compliance and the frameworks that exist today. And again, these are things that I'm not aware that exist on any other network. So last but not least, we're going to get into the financial services and the integrations that the XRPL has here. And these are the two big amendments that have not been passed yet, but I think will lend themselves really well to the XRPL becoming the, the absolute main network that people issue tokenized assets on. So first up is XLS 66D. Sorry, we talked about 64 with the pseudo accounts. We talked about 65 with liquidity pools. 66 is the lending and borrowing protocol. So XLS 66D introduces a native lending and borrowing protocol, enabling decentralized lending and borrowing on the XRPL. This is a massive, massive opportunity for banks to offer new services like loans backed by tokenized assets. For example, a bank could issue a loan using a tokenized property as collateral, like a HELOC, which has already been done on the XRPL, all managed on chain. It would be faster cheaper and more transparent than traditional lending you wouldn't have to have that escrow service or title company there'd just be so many frictions and fees and time that would be saved by utilizing smart contract in this type of infrastructure versus traditional means that exist today so banks could start building decentralized credit markets and bridging traditional assets with DeFi, right using these liquidity pools and the lending and borrowing protocol issued directly on the XRPL. So again, issued assets could be put up as collateral. They could be NFTs. They could be fractionalized. There's so many things that that protocol in particular is going to allow financial institutions to do. And again, that's predicated by all of the compliance and the security features that we just went over. Like all of those are the base things that have to be in place. And then we can get all the cool, sexy stuff that most people want. And that's the last thing here. What we're going to talk about is probably the coolest and sexiest thing of them all. And that is a multi-purpose token. That's XLS82. It has not officially been proposed yet. However, it allows tokens to have multiple functions like voting rights or dividends, right? So if you wanted to issue corporate bonds or equity shares, it's perfect for that. It's the ideal option for tokenized complex financial instruments. Uh, for institutions, this means they can replicate traditional financial products on the blockchain with added efficiency. While this feature is reportedly in development, it is proposed to be a cornerstone for institutional DeFi and make the XRPL a versatile platform for financial innovation, which we all know is coming. Again, you kind of precede that with these other amendments that are, you know, credentials and some other things are still in vote here. But as soon as those roll out and then we get 64, 65, and 66, I think 82 could happen maybe toward the end of this year in 2025 looking for tokenized stock market potentially for the texas stock exchange here in 2026 but we'll see i haven't partial to that i am here in dallas so uh, a little biased on that side but maybe hbar maybe the xrpl there's there's a few competing chains but with this multi-purpose token i think xrp could could really take it uh, so to sum it up these xrpl amendments create a comprehensive platform for banks and institutions to tokenize real world assets securely and compliantly from native NFTs to the AMMs for tokenization and liquidity all the way to digital identity and the clawback for compliance. The XRPL meets the needs for traditional finance while leveraging blockchain's benefits. The lending protocol and the multipurpose token further integrate financial services, positioning XRPL as the leader in institutional DeFi. And Ripple knows it. They got the roadmap. They're going after banks and they're adopting these features. The XRPL will actively grow, driving demand for XRP, which is what we all want if you're invested in it, which powers transactions and cross-border payments and the settlement of all of these tokenized assets, because that's where the value is in the protocol and the use of the protocol, the volume that's going to move across the protocol and have to be settled by the native asset, which is, you and I both love it, XRP, which would make it the cornerstone of the financial system in the future, and again, a tier one asset in my personal opinion. So let me know what you think in the comments below. Which one of these amendments is the most important to you? If you could see something else proposed on the XRPO, what do you think is missing? And I just want to say thanks for watching. Uh, we're over 50,000 subscribers, which is huge. If you could like, subscribe, it does really help the algorithm. And we'll see you guys on the next one.